Hi, welcome to Skip's Corner, where I cover Nashville's baseball history and events and introduce you to players, coaches, and other fans. One of the most rewarding things that I enjoy is when someone tells me about a special memory at a ballpark, whether it be here in Nashville at Greer Stadium or Sulphurdale or First Tennessee and now First Horizon Park, Shelby or Centennial Parks, or some other baseball diamond they played at or watched a game. I even love hearing stories about the ballpark at Atlanta or Cincinnati or St. Louis or Yankee Stadium, for example, all the ballparks. I just love to hear the stories. And if you look on social media, people are willing to tell those stories gladly and share some kind of a memory that they have or experience they have. There's nothing like it. Usually, the memory includes a reference to their grandfather, mother, uncle, or aunt who took them to a game if they're talking about the old days, and certainly their family or a friend these days. You know, sometimes they just went to a ball game as a family or to watch their own children play at the local Little League Park. Well, I think there's nothing like going to a ball game just about anywhere where no one really cares where you go to church just that you do, or what your political affiliation is. No one cares if you are a Methodist or a Catholic or Baptist at the ballpark, and certainly not whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. But there is something about the peaceful nature of a ball game where you can speak to those around you, maybe drum up a new friendship or cheer on your favorite player or team. It is there where people of all walks of life sit among each other in relative peace, no matter whether you are a storekeeper, a clerk, a server, a doctor, or lawyer. A famous Nashville attorney, Jack Norman, retired from practicing law in 1981. He's deceased now, but he often wrote articles in both the Nashville Tennessean and the Nashville Banner about memories of his hometown. He was born in Nashville in 1904, and his column, The Passing of the Nashville I Knew, appeared on a regular basis in the banner and led to the publication of The Nashville I Knew, published by Rutledge Hill Press in 1984. Nashville Banner sports editor Fred Russell wrote in the foreword, Jack Norman looked back over the years, his zest for life undiminished, and reasoned that Nashville was just about the best place on earth, with some of the most vibrating chords of remembrance. Each chapter of Norman's book is written in snapshots of Nashville life that few would remember today. Nashville citizens with an attachment to his descriptions, well, many are long gone, but his recollections follow one after another as if each step he ever took had a memory attached to it, and he relates each one in rapid-fire recall. On page 25 and continuing through page 27 in his book, in a section with the heading, Old Sulphurdale, our friend Jack reminisces as if the old ballpark still existed at the time of his writing. The past gate, right field dump, Bat Boy Mickey Kreitner are all there. Sports writers Blinky Horn and Ralph McGill, managers of the ball club Roy Elam, Jimmy Hamilton and Larry Gilbert and club owner Faye Murray are all there too, as is an entry about a man walking with two jugs of sulfur water from Morgan Park. The most telling descriptor of our beloved Sulphurdale goes like this. He writes, what a great part the old park had played in the entertainment and pleasure of Nashville, how it had helped to relieve the strains and pressures of a young city how its benefits were available to even those with small incomes, how clean and wholesome were its contributions, how satisfied we were with such simple things. As the deer and buffalo had gone there for the pleasure of sulfur and salt, Nashville had gone there for the pleasure and relaxation of our national pastime. Boy, those are great words. I wish I could be so good as to write that way how painful it must have been for him in 1963 as chairman of the board of directors of Vols Incorporated, the corporation which owned the Nashville Vols and Sulphur Dell. He suggested the ball club's franchise 
be relinquished to the South Atlantic League that season at the end of that year. You know, Nashville had a team in the Southern Association from 1901 to 1961. And when the ball club failed, Vols Incorporated purchased it. It was a group of men, civic leaders, who started that corporation to buy the franchise from Ted Murray. And the citizens owned the ball club for all intents and purposes. And there was no pro ball in 1962, but it was resurrected in 1963 as a member of the South Atlantic League. And sadly, that was the last year of professional baseball for 15 years until Larry Schmidt came along in 1978 and started the Nashville Sounds. That resurrected team in 1963, it just failed to draw enough fans to support the Vols. Now, according to Nashville, Tennessean sports writer F.M. Williams, Norman blamed the failure on a variety of things when he wrote, these are Norman's thoughts in Williams' column, an upsurge and increase of interest in fan participation sports, such as boating, fishing, bowling, and golf, the increased interest in football and basketball, the availability of various other modern types of entertainment, the opportunity to see Major League Baseball by television in the comforts of home, and lastly, the attitude of Major League Baseball toward Minor League Baseball. And Norman added one final lament to his thoughts in Williams' column. I am positive that no further effort, civic or otherwise, will bring it back. Well, he was wrong, but it took 15 years for Larry Schmidt to bring the team back in 1978. A number of years ago, when I began Sulphurdale.com, you can also find it at BaseballInNashville.com, I did that to commemorate Nashville's old ballpark. And one of the most rewarding things I added in the early days was an I Remember page, where interested folks could write in their special memory. Not long after, two persons wrote to me about their recollection of the long-gone park told to them through each one's grandfather who had been a player for the Nashville Vols. And it turned out that they had been teammates in the 1930s, pitcher Byron Spees and infielder Bill Rada. During subsequent emails and phone conversations, we were able to determine that the grandsons lived within a few miles of each other in Northern California. And they were able to meet and swap family and baseball information in their attempts to piece together each grandfather's baseball history. One of those I wrote about, Irene Spies Thorin, who wrote a letter to me, that's the daughter of Byron Spies, and I have been in touch with Bill Rada's nephew. In fact, he's coming to Nashville with his uncle, who was Bill Rada's son, to attend a Nashville Vols game later on in May. And those things just thrill me. It is heartwarming for historical facts and lore to be retold and is valuable to not only families, but historians alike. And when important information begins with memories, it often can take the form of history that helps to complete family stories. The results truly cannot be measured. So my cap's off to anyone who has assisted people who have a quest to complete their family history. Children and grandchildren have numerous sources in libraries, archives, and websites to assist in research, but conversations, photo albums, and even blogs are valuable resources as well. And if one has a baseball player in their past, the best source for research is through the Society for American Baseball Research, which can be found at sabr.org. And that information within the online source is not limited to sabermetrics. Sabermetrics is the measurement of statistics and other information. And a lot of people are interested in sabermetrics, and I'm not. I'm more of a history buff and like the tradition and the history of baseball. Other analytical data is obviously available on saber.org, but player stats, teams, birthplaces, and much more, they're all readily available there, all within a few keystrokes by one's fingertips. We should also be digging through attics and basements for those out-of-pocket memories But once the remembering and searching happens, it's all for naught should we not write them down. We cannot take for granted that future generations will not be interested. I've heard people say that their grandchildren, their children and grandchildren don't want the antiques that 
that they may have collected over the years. I even worry about that sometimes with some of the memorabilia, but sometimes our children and grandchildren surprise us. In our own personal book of knowledge, even if it's just inside your head, on family members will provide invaluable information to future family generations. We all want to know where we came from. We all want to know about our families in some cases. We don't, but in most cases we do. After all, aren't we only a generation away from being forgotten? Then, if someone asks a family question, who will be there to answer? Sit your grandparents and your parents down, your aunts and uncles too, and ask them to tell you about their memories. Their experiences may not flow at first, but with some prodding, I bet you will wonder where the time went after you finish writing down those things that they tell you. Go to them with simple questions like, where were you born? And what do you remember about your grandmother? Who knows? Some of their fondest memories might have to do with seeing a baseball game. Now, I'm sure it may not have come easy for Jack Norman in the beginning either. But once he started, he had an entire book written. Well, we can take Jack Norman as an example. And I wish I could do what he did and write like he did, write the long flowing stories that he wrote because his memory at the time, at 80 years old, from, from being born in 1904 till this book was published in 1984, man, it is chock full, and I encourage you to get that book, The Nashville I Knew by Jack Norman. If I can ever help you with your research in any way, steer you to a certain a website, there are lots of websites online these days that can help you, or a library source. I've been to the library several times, and I Don't tell you that I can answer every question that you may have, but I'll bet you with some of the contacts that can be made, you can learn a lot about your family. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this segment of baseball history, maybe Nashville history, and a little bit of prodding that you would actually go to your family and find out more information and go do some research on your own. Yes, it can be time consuming, but I'll tell you, it is one of the most rewarding things you'll ever do. Thanks for listening.